is that a God that you want to have a closer walk with? That's what I want. That's what my heart's desire is this morning. Our family has been using a devotional book this year titled God of Wonders. And it's by the chairman of the biology department at my alma mater, Andrews University. And a couple months ago, he told a story there that had happened in his home a few years ago. He said that they woke up on an unusually cold day in Tennessee. The temperatures had dropped below zero. And when they went out to the garage, they found that his daughter's pet hamster had not survived that cold weather. And so they were doing something they weren't familiar with doing on, a, on an early morning. As the sun was coming up before he took the kids to school, he, he brought a shovel out from the garage and they found an appropriate place in the backyard and he was breaking through that, that frozen dirt to make a shallow grave for the pet hamster. He was wondering um, if he should feel any guilt and responsibility for what had happened because that pet hamster normally stayed inside the house. And he said his generally reliable and responsible daughter at the age of nine was responsible for caring for this hamster, but somehow she was always busy. And so the, um, the level of disagreeable odor kept rising. And so he determined that that hamster would go out into the garage until the clay cage could be cleaned on a regular basis. So he took the, the fancy running wheel and, and all the, the colorful tubes and the, the whole cage and, and put it out in the garage. And now the, the hamster had paid the supreme price with, um, with his life. So he dropped the kids off at school and he went on to work. And about midday, he was of course reflecting on all the tears and trauma of the morning and he thought to himself, I wonder if that hamster is hibernating. There's only one way to find out. So he, he took his lunch break and he ran home and, and got that shovel again, went out to that spot in the backyard and, and now very gently lifted that, that melting earth from on top of their pet hamster and, and found the hair all matted with dirt and was trying to brush it off and took it inside the house, put it in a shoebox back beside their, their wood-burning stove and made a sandwich for his lunch, waiting to see what might happen. He kept looking into that box and, and pretty soon that little nose started to, to twitch and the body kind of shook and a little bit and and soon it was standing up and it was bright-eyed as usual and scurrying around exploring every nook and cranny well when he picked his kids up from school they were delighted he was a hero and life was good again and the cage get, kept clean but he said as a professional biologist, he was a bit chagrined that his first thought had not been hibernation. Spiritually, are you in hibernation? Maybe, maybe perhaps going through the motions, um, someone from the external might never notice that you're in spiritual hibernation. You're here in church, you're going through the external routines, but spiritually, in your heart, have you grown cold? Is there something that is no longer flickering and, and burning brightly in your walk with God? Genesis chapter 5, verses 22, 3, and 4 carries a very short account of one of the great patriarchs who lived before the flood. It says, And he begat Methuselah, after he begat Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. A few short words, but Enoch walked with God. What an incredible experience. Now, some of us might be tempted to say, well, 
he probably just spent all of his time with God. He probably didn't have many responsibilities to care for. Um, he, he didn't have a family to take care of and work to do. But if we take a look at the text, it says that um, he had sons and daughters. We don't know how many, but both are plural. And probably in 300 years, that's time for a lot of sons and daughters. So he knew what it was like to have a full family life, to have kids running around and trying to corral them and, 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 and working with a, a full family, and then a work life in order to support all those children that are running around. He knew what it was like to carry responsibility, but he would, in the midst of all of his active responsibilities in life, he would take time on a regular basis to commune with God, to talk with God. And we're told that the more, the more pressing his responsibilities, the greater the stress that he had in life, the more constant was his communication with God. He knew that was the source of his strength, the source of his, his power in life. And there were times when he would even pull himself apart from, from everyone in order to have quality time in the presence of God to, to develop that walk with him. He hungered and thirst to know God, to walk with God. And he came more and more to reflect what God was and what God was like. I want that in my walk with God. I want every day to be closer to him and, and every day for, for people not to see me, but to see God working, to, to, to see some, something else. Um, that, that walk is, is an ongoing journey. It, it's, it's a never-ending process of growing closer to him. Now, walking is a great source of physical exercise. Um, we're told that it helps to, to fight obesity. It um, helps our heart, um, helps to, to fight diabetes. Matter of fact, um, um, you can go out after eating and, and, and walk for 10 minutes, and it will drop your blood sugar down appreciably. It helps to contribute to a positive emotional outlook on life. Walking is a great exercise that, that most of us can take part in on a regular basis. Spiritually, we can walk as well. And there, there are some things that, that help us in our spiritual walk. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. A great promise, and we don't usually look at the last part of the verse. The first part there is therefore now no condemnation to the, those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a great promise. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The, the, the power of sin is broken and we are no longer condemned to death because we have Jesus Christ. We're free of condemnation. And it goes on then, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We're, we're freed from the condemnation of sin, and now we are able to walk according to the Spirit. There's a little devotional book that I enjoyed when I was in high school entitled Sons and Daughters of God. And there's a, a passage in there that says, we are to keep the Lord ever before us. Those who do this, keeping the Lord ever before them, walk with God as did Enoch. And imperceptibly to themselves, they become one with the Father and with the Son. Imperceptibly to themselves. They, they don't even realize day by day that, that this transformation is taking place. It says, day by day, a change is brought upon mind and heart, and the natural inclination, the natural ways are molded after God's ways and spirit. Day by day, as we walk with God as we keep him before us our lives are changed molded more and more into his likeness and it, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual principle that, that applies in our life the things that we behold that's what we become more like um, I, I see it happening with, with my kids the more time they spend with whatever the more they want to become like whatever it is that they're watching and so the, the natural question for us, if we want to walk with God, 
what is the focus of our life? What, what are the things that get our best attention? Now, realistically, we have work, we have responsibilities, but what is it that gets your, your best and closest attention? Um, what are the things that you spend the most screen time with? What are those things that, that, that are molding your thoughts and your life? We can let it be Jesus Christ. We can become, imperceptibly to us, more and more like him. And it even changes our natural ways and our, our natural desires so that they're more like his. An interesting thing with, um, with our walk with God some of you may have years ago started your walk with God and said, I am going to commit my life to Jesus Christ. And the sooner you do that in life, all the better. There are a number of young people here. The sooner you decide, I want to spend my life walking with God, the, the greater your life is going to be. But part of the challenge is that we need to continue that walk. We can decide at one point in our life, okay, we want to walk with God, but does that mean we're willing to continue to walk with Him? Continue that experience of growing in our relationship with Him. You, we can't have a walk with God and dig in our heels and say, no more. God, I'm, I'm willing to take that step, that step, that step, this step, but here and no farther. You want me to go here and I, I don't think. I'm willing to take that step with you, God. That part of my life I claim is my own, and I'm not going to give it to you. At that point, our walk with God comes to a stop. We're, we're held back in our growth. And the question is, are, are there steps that God is calling you to in your walk with him that, that he says, trust me, trust me. I was talking about this, this idea of walking with, with a young man who has learned to ride the unicycle. And that's something I've, I've played with riding a unicycle, but that's all I've ever done. I've never really mastered it. I remember when I was in college, there was a guy on campus and he would ride his unicycle all around. Um, did, did a great job with it. But this, this friend of mine, David, he said the unicycle is similar to walking in that you actually have to get off balance before you can go forward. With the unicycle, you lean forward, but instead of falling when, when you know how to do this, you, you simply pedal and, and you move forward. And walking is much the same way. When you think about it, we don't walk like this. You, you lean forward as you're walking, and if you don't put your foot out, you're going to fall. Now, of course, we, we learn to do that automatically. We don't think about that. But there's a trust factor with walking. If you're going to walk, you're going to lean forward, and you're going to, you have to exercise faith. And when we walk with God, we exercise faith in Him that, yes, I can lean forward. I, I, can, I, can, I can go forward as He calls me to, to, to walk. And I may not know exactly where my, my foot is going to land, but I know who I'm walking with, and so I can trust Him. I, I, can, I can get a little out of balance. And oftentimes, day by day, he calls us to, to kind of push those comfort zones, to trust him, and to allow him to lead us into areas that, that are beyond our current experience. But he wants us to experience a greater fullness in our walk with him. Psalm 143, verse 8, talks about the way God guides us. It says, cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. A prayer that God would help us to know which way to walk, because we don't always know. Um, in our zeal, sometimes we can say, you know, this, this walking is just too slow. I'm going to start running. Well, the, the problem is, if Jesus is walking and you're running, you're, you're no longer with Jesus anymore. And that's where our zeal needs to, be, needs to be guided by our walk with Jesus. Some people get, get overzealous, and, and, and they're, they're running off in a direction without Jesus anymore. 
or they're, they're wandering off to the left or the right instead of staying side by side with Jesus Christ. Following the scriptures, the word, the revelation of Jesus, helps us in that steady, daily, developing, consistent walk, staying close to him and his word. There was a young woman who came to the pastor of, of the church that she had been going to and said that she, she wanted to become a member. She wanted to, to walk with Jesus and, and be baptized. And so the pastor had a couple questions for her. He said, were you a sinner before you received Jesus into your life? And she said, well, yes, yes I was. And he said, well, are you still a sinner now? And she thought and she said, well, to tell the truth, I feel like I'm an even greater sinner now than before I came into a relationship with Jesus. And then he said, well, what real change has happened in your life? And she said, well, I'm not sure how to explain it, except I used to be a sinner that was running after sin, and now I'm a sinner running away from sin. That walk with Jesus, the desires of her heart had changed, and she, she wanted to, to move away from the sin in her life in order to be with God. Our faith is deepened by our walk with God. The distractions, the discouragements of this life start to lose their hold on us. In the account of the birth of Jesus, there's a, a title that's given to him that, that we don't use as often, except in some of our, our Christmas songs. Um, this, this will come out. But Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, actually is built on a prophecy from the Old Testament. It says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Jesus came to be with us. He's, he, he's acquainted with what it's like um, to live with, with challenges. He knows what it's like to experience grief in loss in this world. And he understands what it's like to, to deal with the, the difficulties that we have. And he promises that he will always be with us. Down to the end of the age, he is with us. When we walk, we are walking with someone that makes all the difference in the world. We are walking with someone who wants to be with us. The Old Testament, the, the prophet Amos says, can two walk together unless, they want, unless they're agreed? And you think about that, we can walk with Jesus. Do we expect Jesus to change, to be more like us? I don't think that's going to happen. That's not the way the scriptures describe Jesus. But we can change to become more like him. And that's, that's the transition that he's calling us to, that he wants us to experience. He promises to be with us. In Psalm 23, the, the shepherd psalm, it talks about the, the Lord is our shepherd, I shall not want. But it also talks about, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. No fear because God is with us. It doesn't say that we avoid the shadows. But when you think about it, there cannot be shadows unless there is light. We don't walk in darkness. In order for there to be shadows, it means there is a source of light. And even during the darkest times in our lives, when the shadows are greatest, there is a source of light that continues to guide us. And Jesus says that he will always be with us no matter how difficult our times are. He doesn't say he will remove the challenge, but that he will be with us. So we can walk with God. We have a lot of choices that we have to make in life. Some of them are, are very small choices. Um, what are you going to eat for lunch today? Do you want broccoli or peas or, I guess, maybe no vegetables? Um, what color socks do you want to put on? Do you want them to match today or not? And uh, Lots of choices. Some of them are, are much more important, though. Um, who do you choose to marry? Who is going to be your mate? 
pretty big choice that will have a, a long-term impact in your life. What career will you pursue? What, what, what education will you, will you um, endeavor to earn in order to, to pursue that career? Will you have children? How many children? Pretty important decisions and impacting other people as well. But the greatest decision that we'll make is which God will we serve? We will serve a God. It's not optional to decide, I don't think I'm going to serve any God. There is going to be a God in our lives. We ourselves may be a God and we'll say, okay, I think I'm going to be the one that, that governs everything in my life. And when you think of how much you know, and more importantly, how much you don't know, you start to realize, well, that's a pretty short-sighted decision to trust yourself with all the, all the decisions of life. We can choose other gods of pleasure, profit, personal ambition. But we can also choose the creator God, the saving God, the reigning king. We can recognize 1 John 4.9. 1 John is just filled with, with so many great passages um, describing the, the relationship that we can have with God. But 1 John chapter 4.19 gives us part of the compelling reason to, to walk with him. It says, we love him because he first loved us. That's pretty winsome. When, when, when someone is... is caring about you, is attentive to you, that, that, that is very appealing. And God says he loves us first. And, and he, he calls us to him. He attracts us to him. He's a God who is willing to, to help us whenever we need help, whether the, the help is, is um, a wisdom and understanding, whether the help is is in, in relationships, whether the help is with physical things, Jesus knows how to touch people and make a difference in their life. God is a God of all knowledge. If any of us are, are needing wisdom, we can go to him. He says he will always be with us. Another devotional that I enjoyed when I was, was younger is our high calling. It said, God must be ever in our thoughts. We must hold, converse with him while we walk by the way and while our hands are engaged in labor. In all the purposes and pursuits of life, we must inquire, what will the Lord have me to do? How can I please him who has given his life a ransom for me? This way we will walk with God as did Enoch of old, and ours may be the testimony that he received, that he pleased God. The question is, who, who are we going to walk with? Who gets the greatest of our energies and our thoughts? In that passage in, in Genesis that talks about Enoch, it says that Enoch walked with God and God took him. That's the experience that, that each one of us can have as well. God promises that he's not just a creator, he's not just a savior, but he's a returning king, that, that he will continue to impact our lives throughout eternity if we will allow him to. And in fact, the, the last reference we have to walking in the scriptures is in Revelation chapter 21, next to last chapter. It's describing the holy city, the city that, that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. And he says he will come back and take us to be with him there. And it says in Revelation 21, Beginning with verse 22, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. The walk that we have with Jesus now is the walk that he wants to, to have us enjoy with him throughout eternity. Walking in the light of his presence. Walking on the streets of the New Jerusalem. Walking day by day, enjoying his presence, enjoying his power, enjoying his, his guiding wisdom in our life. 
that walk we can we can begin now and continue throughout eternity there is no better choice there is no greater difference that we can experience in our life than to choose to walk with God.